Was in the merry month of May When green buds they were swelling Young William Green on his deathbed lay For the love of Barbary Allen He sent his brother to the town To the place where she To my brother dear If your name be Barbary Allen So slowly, slowly she got up And slowly she drew nigh him And the only words to him did say Young man, I think you're dying. He turned his face onto the wall, and death was in him. Whirling. Goodbye, goodbye to my friends all. Be good to Barry Allen.
Hi everyone, uh, my name is Elizabeth Oganek and uh, I am the composer of the piece that you just heard. Uh, I'm also a 2012 Marshall Scholar and it's a great pleasure to uh, welcome you to this project uh, that we've called Music Across Space, uh, which is uh, presented by the uh, uh, Association of Marshall Scholars uh, as part of their Arts and Humanities series. Um, in fact, this has been, this whole project has been a collaboration with Marshall Scholars, Soros Fellows, and a CUNY Graduate Center Fellow. And so I'd like to introduce you uh, all to, um, to my collaborators. Uh, joining me today is uh, Michael Pohl, who's a London-based classical guitarist and uh, conductor, uh, who is also a 2012 Marshall Scholar. Um, also here is Emmy Ferguson, who is a New York-based flutist, vocalist, and uh, composer, and uh, a Soros Fellow for New Americans. Um, also here is architect uh, Juan Jofre, uh, who's a New York-based architect, uh, he's a New York-based architect um, and also a Soros Fellow. Um, and uh, we also have uh, Nico Namoradza, who's a pianist and composer uh, who's in Berlin at the moment. I have the pleasure of introducing also my good friend, uh, composer AJ McCaffrey, who is an associate professor of composition at Cal State Northridge, um, and also is one of the founding composers of the uh, Composers Fellowship Program at the Los Angeles Philharmonic. And he will be uh, leading a discussion with all of us about our project. Um, at the end of this discussion, uh, we invite you to raise questions. We ask that uh, you audience members put your questions in the Q&A box and um, we will do our best to answer them. So without further introduction, uh, AJ. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Um, my first question was, I was wondering if one of you could uh, introduce this project and perhaps just sort of describe its origins, describe how it came to be. Sure, so I think that we got started, um, the, the Association of Marshall Scholars wanted to uh, do something special during these corona times. And um, one of the unique things about the, the scholarship is that it also includes artists and musicians of all sorts. Um, and so this started uh, as a conversation with them. Um, and then we expanded out to think of, well, it may be nicer to do something in a group. So um, that's how Soros got involved. And then uh, I believe um, Julie Suk, who's the the dean of the Graduate Center um, and was also a Marshall Scholar herself. Uh, she said we have this absolutely wonderful pianist and, and that's how we were very lucky to be connected with Nico. Um, so that's how it all got started. And uh, it was very open-ended and so it's been a really collaborative uh, and as you can see, slightly untraditional um, but hopefully compelling uh, way of approaching music in a different uh, in a different time and for different circumstances. Yeah, I'll, I'll add to that also that I think one of the really um, interesting things is that they, the, um, the Marshalls um, fellows reached out to the Soros, but uh, you know, usually, you know, they reached out and, um, and usually things are kept, you know, within their groups. And so, so this is a kind of like a, a musical venture, it seemed like. And so it, it seemed destined to remain a musical venture until Emmy reached out to me and asked, if I wanted to join, and I, I kind of will say I had like a sense of like not knowing why I was joining, but it sounded like a fun uh, summer project. So, so I think, um, but once we, we I, I sort of, it was really fun to join um, partially because it, it's just so different from the work that I, that I usually do. And it, I think also forced all the musicians to talk about their music in a slightly different way. So I think it was very collaborative also because of that, because we were, um, you know, reaching not only across space like we're talking in right now, but also across disciplines. And so we were sort of forced to uh, learn each other's language a little bit. As an architect, right, you were, you were, your role in this project, just to clarify, you, you've designed this space, right? This is your, this, the virtual space we're seeing is your space. Is that correct? Yeah, 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 yeah. So um, that, that's kind of what I did um, specifically for the gotcha. project was sort of to, to design uh, I guess a venue for us. Um, 
But, but I think more broadly, I think we, we were all interested in was like, how do we reach across space? So we were just really more thinking about spatially, what does that mean in terms of, um, you know, we're all in, in different parts of the world and we're all kind of in a similar space and like most of us are in our small apartments or homes um, in one room. And so like, how do we transcend, transcend that? And so I think a lot of the, the things that we talked about were sort of tricks with how to play with with time and space, um, and then and then how to make a communal gathering area. A lot of us uh, who are performing musicians have done a lot of Zoom concerts or live stream concerts since the beginning of our shutdown. And um, when we first met, I think we were all a little bit tired and exhausted of the the usual Zoom concert that we saw. So we we really wanted to come up with. Um, an experience not only for the audience but also for ourselves that was challenging and exciting in different ways and so um, when Elizabeth and Michael and the Marshall Scholars approached um, Soros I thought like it would just be amazing to have someone like Juan who is thinking about space in a completely different way than we often do as performers. I just want to add to that also um, and uh, you know we were really we were really trying to I think that the challenge we posed for ourselves was how to create, you know, a seamless experience because we're all bringing very different things to to this project. Um, you know, we have performers here. We have Juan, who's an architect, um, and then you know, at the end, you heard a large ensemble piece, um, which obviously was not performed live. Uh, and so, um, you know, our vision for all of this was was you know, how can we create? How can we take uh, what we, you know, are essentially doing in our little apartments and create this, you know, very seamless, uh, seamless Zoom experience um, that can lead into, you know, a, a, a large ensemble piece that is not performed live. So um, I think that was, that was uh, part of our thinking as well. With the music that we heard, um, we first heard a, a traditional folk song that was sung by Emmy. Uh, then we had an instrumental version of that folk song arranged by the American composer Robert Beezer that was with Michael and Emmy. Uh, then Michael gave us the Bach prelude on, on solo guitar. And then we had a pair of piano etudes. We had one written by Nico and then one by the post-impressionist Russian composer Alexander Skriabin. And then finally we heard uh, the piece that Elizabeth just mentioned, her work uh, for large ensemble entitled The Water Canto. So uh, my question is, I'm really curious about this selection of pieces and I'm curious about the threads that connect them or don't connect them. And I'm, I, I'm, how do these works speak to each other? That's a great question. Um, and I think what we're seeing, you know, when you have um, concerts that are happening online, when people can't physically be in the same space, then uh, you have to figure out, well, can I do a solo piece or, you know, and how do those work? Does it just become a variety show? Um, and, and how can we actually link those things that are sort of would be variety show if they were just on a stage? And that's really where Juan's design, you know, came into this whole thing. It, it was the, the, the factor that linked all of these different pieces together. Um, I know that um, for the Beezer, we, we chose that because it could be performed separately together because of um, the antiphonal nature of the writing there. So that was definitely part of that choice. Um, but then I'll sort of let Michael and, and Nico and Elizabeth speak to their choices. Well, I, I think that for me, one of the things that I was looking for was like unification through like a musical concept that we could then explore in the context of architecture as well. So I think that like for me, I saw a connection between the pieces in, in textures and in the way in which like different composers have thought about exploring texture or, or not. So like in folk music, we think of like, um, like a simple and spare line that, that's sort of expository and kind of like works to communicate and like an, an emotion, usually a single emotion. And for me, that's very connected with like Bach's idea about rhetoric and about the passions that were you know, part of that time in music making, where they were really trying to express a, a single thing, not necessarily their individual single thing, but to get the listener to feel a thing. And so that's sort of how those two pieces are linked. And then if like the Beezer piece kind of stands between them as a way of exploring 
uh, like what happens if you change the texture of a traditional folk song and like what is the role of musical color in in shaping that and then that question of like using texture to shape musical color I think is also central to both the both Nico's etude and to this Griavin piece and also then to Elizabeth's piece but I'll let them talk more about that. The two pieces that I played relate to this theme in slightly different ways so my etude um, approaches the question of space, I guess, by translating it into musical register. Namely, you have something moving through space, as in through the register of the piano keyboard, and hits up against the wall, which is a kind of arbitrary boundary, and then goes in the other direction. So I guess register became a kind of dynamic space, much in the way Juan is designing the space and putting up a wall here, putting up a wall there, and the hands at the beginning uh, bounce off these invisible registral walls at the same time, but then when these walls start to shift at different times and the hands go out of sync and stop moving in a coordinated fashion, and that's what uh, kind of spurs this disintegration and inc increasing chaos in the texture. Um, whereas uh, the Scriabin etude, I feel, is part of a set of Scriabin pieces that are or are somehow about water. Uh, Scriabin was obsessed with water and the way in which turbulence in water, whether in a river or an ocean, reflects inner turmoil. For, the, for him, this was a metaphor of kind of one's own troubled personality, in a sense. So I felt that uh, the kind of pol polyrhythmic gurgling <laughs> in, in the Scriabin uh, etude is certainly part of his kind of water textures, and I felt that that would be a good segue into Elizabeth's piece, which is itself about a river. Uh, the the music that you heard though is actually uh, the second movement of a uh, four movement piece uh, for a large ensemble. It's written for flute, two clarinets, um, three percussionists, piano, four cellos, and double bass. Um, and the piece when I wrote the piece, which was written in two thousand eighteen, it um, it's it was meant to serve essentially as a kind of travel log uh, through these four places that are very close to my heart. Um, and this particular movement um, that you heard uh, is actually called Falling Blue. Um, and it is supposed to be sort of reminiscent of a river in Oregon um, called Elk River. Uh, it's in Southern Oregon and it's a river that has been protected from logging. And so um, it's, it's pristine, it's, um, it has this sort of moss aquamarine um, verging on emerald color and it's very cold. And um, my experience of this river um, uh, felt very much like I was, you know, walking through a kind of enchanted forest. And especially when I think about it sort of in my, my memory, it has, um, uh, you know, it has this kind of enchanted, almost fantastical quality to it. Um, and so when I was writing, uh, when I was writing this particular movement, I was very much interested in these ideas of, of texture that, um, that Michael uh, brought up, um, that is, you know, in many ways a thread through all of the works on this program. Um, I was thinking about ways of taking this particular instrumentation and kind of creating music that had a, a water-like quality that still captured the magic, um, but like constantly sort of changing, changing the textures and changing the sound worlds that that you're hearing, so that it's always um, it's it's always kind of like as a listener, you're taking a left turn into new material in the way that you would sort of walk through you know, maybe an enchanted forest and, and kind of come across these things that you're, you're not expecting. So um, I, um, to me, these pieces are all very much connected. Uh, you know, there's this sort of water theme in the background, um, but very much connected with, with this idea of texture. And as a composer, I'm strangely a very visual person. Um, and so these textures have like a very uh, kind of visual uh, component in my mind. Um, and so I feel like that's in a way where, where Juan's work um, really enters into this project for me. And I'll add, I think one of the things is like, I mean, obviously, um, you know, I, I wasn't part, I mean, I was part of the, of the selection process, but from a very uninformed position, right? Uh, I'm not the one suggesting musical pieces. 
But but once the the team sort of selected the pieces, I think one of the things that I was interested was in sort of creating um, a sequence that in my head sort of correlated and or at least correlated with how I understood the music or, or ex experienced the music. And I think um, the first couple pieces for me are more pictorial and the, the, the latter pieces are more um, textured and abstract. And I think that's also why you begin with a very simple scene and that sort of um, uh, becomes more abstract and becomes more about the sort of the textures of the water that we see later. Um, uh, and so it's this kind of a progression from, from very pictorial to very abstract, I think, um, in the visual composition, which I think tries to, in a sense, play to at least some of the things that I was, some of the images that I was seeing uh, or, or, or experiencing in listening to the music. You've both, uh, actually, uh, you've spoken about texture. Elizabeth and Michael have spoken about texture. It's, it's really fascinating to hear that, that each of you are kind of coming to these, these concepts, these sort of tenets of, of what's happening kind of on uh, both as a group and, and, and also separately. And what I just wanted to, to, to throw out there as an observer, really seeing this all together for the first time is, is, is the advantage that this kind of space, even though we, we might not think of this as an ideal presentation, there's choreography here. There's choreography here that may not actually be possible on, on a stage that we can really, that we can really kind of guide the viewer and the listener sort of through these pieces. And I thought that was just uh, phenomenal. Juan, I wanted to, um, I wanted to, uh, to address a question to you um, and, and again, sort of uh, uh, single out your, the accomplishment of the space that you've created. I just think it's absolutely stunning. Um, and you've talked about texture. I'm, I'm kind of curious about um, how does your, in this kind of project, how does your concept for space change when it's not physical, when you have to deal with this? I mean, you spoke a little bit about being able to move between kind of different sort of maybe pictorial versus texture was that was that kind of the uppermost challenge for you or was there something else for me the the the, the most interesting part was the challenge of how to make it seem like multiple individuals were in the same space um and of course um that once we sort of started talking about that it became about okay how do we actually then build a space around them um that that sort of um begins to be developed as the pieces are being played. So, so it, that was, a, I think it was the first a decision, like how do we, how do we connect people um, and put them in the same, you know, in this case, virtual space. Uh, and then um, how do we actually build that space so that it feels like that there is a process in that, um, that, is, that is dynamic. And so, um, you know, the, the funny thing is in, in, um, a very practical sense, the way that, that I ended up actually making the space is like actually designing a physical space modeled after um, a home that, uh, that I've been working, uh, thinking about that is sort of set in a, in a kind of pastoral landscape, uh, which to me was um, when I listened to the first couple of pieces um, was kind of the imagery that I had it was a pastoral landscape, but that then I wanted to not just be um, uh, sort of stuck in a time period, but sort of uh, bring it into the contemporary moment. And so that's, I think, when I, that, those are kind of the images that I was thinking about. And so I actually just actually built that space, um, you know, using computer, like digital software to, to model actually the, 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 the place. And then um, I started to sort of bring in additional elements that would tie in to some of the other pieces. So that's why, you know, there's that, that sort of water uh, visual in the background, which was also, you know, added into the model so that it could then be rendered in and, and, um, and worked with. So that it's a lot about, about how to get, it's actually like in a funny way, you, you build the space, you first conceptualize it. Um, and, then, and then you actually go through the process very similar to how I would if I was actually doing a, a real space. You just you just have to build it. Yeah, it's 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 such it's such a compelling space, and it really 
is so captivating. I've really never seen anything like this in a kind of a virtual way with performers. Um, I wanted to bring uh, Emmy and maybe Nico into the conversation about texture, if, if, as this seems to be a theme, certainly sonic texture, certainly physical textures. If you had, uh, 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 Emmy and Nico in particular, if you had any thoughts on, on your roles in this in terms of your relationship to texture as performers, as musicians. I think what's really interesting about um, the digital space that we've all been living in is that it is it is a two-dimensional texture. We lack that kind of dynamicism that we're we're used to in live performance, and so you know uh, how do how do we create that so that um, as an audience member you feel like you are you know like in the. <laughs> uh, the, the action, so to speak. And so not only doing that, but also building parts of Juan's design that are animated as well. Um, and thinking about the texture within the texture that you're in. And like, there's always these multiple layers that we're dealing with and it's applying really all of the same things that we think about in terms of live performance, um, especially when it's like a more theatrical production um, to just the digital space. And it's amazing what you can do purely just with Zoom software. To look at it from a performance perspective, I mean, of course, as a composer, one constantly thinks about texture, and I think Elizabeth spoke about this in some detail, but I can imagine few instruments where one's perpetual concern is texture as much as it would be for any pianist, because a lot of the time um, when one is playing, I'd say the majority of the other instruments um, in, 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 in the selection that we have, uh, one is often thinking about texture as part of a larger texture, but uh, given the fact that we as pianists are most of the time playing solo repertoire or a, lo a lot of the time and one is dealing with so many things at the same time, um, texture is something we constantly have to think about and is probably the primary concern when it comes to balancing things and simply how we present the material that's written on the page to the public because we need to make a decision as to, you know, in these simultaneities and these verticalities, what do we bring to the foreground and what do we put in the background. So this kind of spatial conception of sound is something we constantly have to do simply because of the number of things that we have to deal with. And unlike other keyboard, in, keyboard instruments such as let's say the harpsichord, um, one is constantly voicing each note. Uh, so this, this idea of having things in the foreground or background is something one is constantly dealing with from a tactile perspective. And also the space one is in, in, whatever concert hall one may be in, will also change that tactile recalibration of how one's presenting the texture to the public. So a situation such as this, where we are all in different spaces, actually, where we're actually recording this material and then putting it together in a virtual space is a very interesting kind of, uh, requires a kind of reconception of the idea of what is the medium through which we are presenting this. And I think what Juan managed to do to bring us all together into the same space, yet keep some differences into our actual positions in the space. We all have, you know, uh, different spots and I'm, <laughs> I'm in the window or the picture frame and then Elizabeth's kind of spirit is hovering <laughs> uh, over us, you know, later on in a kind of more abstract way is a remarkable way of keeping our own perspectives on that same space. So we are together, yet we bring our own kind of angle to it, both metaphorically and quite literally. We are all approaching it from different angles as we are right now. We are in slightly different positions in this space. So there, there are so many interesting layers to uh, a kind of more objective and subjective conception of texture and space in this project that yeah, it, it's been really wonderful to do. That really dovetails um, uh, well into the, the, the actually uh, questions that we're getting uh, uh, from, our, from our audience, from our viewers, and one of the last questions I had, um, which is the idea of, uh, and, and Nico, thank you for touching on this. I think it's, it's, it's such a huge question for all of us. How does this affect the collaboration? And I'm wondering if maybe Michael and Elizabeth could lead us off on this, on this question. A lot of people are asking, are you going to do this again? They kind of, I think they want more. Do you see this as, you know, as, as we're in such an uncertain time, do you see this as a kind of something that could, that, that could maybe be a viable model uh, for sort of uh, non-physical spaces as you work through this collaboration? And maybe I'd be curious to get you, uh, some more thoughts on this idea of collaborating outside of an immediate physical space. So maybe Elizabeth or Michael, you could, you could start us off about 
what you think the, the future holds. <laughs> I think that it's, this was very much sort of a, um, a sort of a, a trial of sorts. I mean, the series itself is a bit experimental and um, there uh, are going to be future events that are already lined up on the 10th of July and 7th of August that are in the series that I'll tell you a little bit more about at the end. But in terms of music, it's definitely something that's on our radar and that we hope to be able to do more of. Um, but I think it's a question of um, finding the right partners and just making sure that it's something that we're able to deliver at a, in a good way and at a high level and with some interesting um, thought and work behind it. Because I, I can say for my part, I mean, this, this event would not have been pop. I mean, it was a true collaboration. I mean, Emmy is a wizard with video that you know, hasn't been mentioned yet. And this literally wouldn't have happened without you know, Emmy's chops in that way. You know, Juan with the space, um, Elizabeth and Nico with the, the brilliant music. So it's um, hopefully something that we'll be able to do again. But yeah, to to be to be continued in that way. I just want to add that you know we were very fortunate that this was like such a spontaneous collaboration. You know, I, I mean, like. I realized that I knew Emmy from a previous life when we got on our first call, for example. And Juan, I had never met. Nico, I had never met. Um, Michael, I've known for a long time. And it just sort of turned out that this particular collaboration um, worked really well. We've sort of joked around about doing other projects, um, maybe that will actually lead to something in the future. Uh, we've talked about doing projects in, in real life, um, not just virtual events, uh, but this has certainly, I think, at least for me, I can't speak on anyone else's behalf, but for me has sort of opened up the possibilities of what uh, a virtual um, kind of concert experience can can be and, and what it can yield, so. One of the uh, questions that we got uh, was, uh, you know, how, how might this space improve access to music and art to people who may not normally have access to, to, to the concert experience, even, even kind of separating it out from COVID, even post-COVID, who may still not be able to attend, uh, attend concerts and to witness something like this. And I think uh, uh, for, uh, from my perspective, certainly it looks, um, it, it's, it's, it's incredible to see something that's really uh, you know, a Zoom performance that's really, again, choreographed and 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 kind of and kind of put together like this. Um, I wanted just to uh, to to invite Emmy and and Juan if they had any uh, uh, final thoughts on on collaboration or if if they had any thoughts on kind of uh, where they might see this going from here. And and Juan, I was curious. You know, when we talk about putting something like this together, um, you know. I, I would imagine from your end, there's a lot of labor that goes on behind the scenes. And, and it's a very practical question, but just how much how much time and effort it put to it took to put something like this together. I mean, uh, on a collaboration from that collaboration standpoint, I mean, I think this has been really exciting. It's it's also for me as an architect at the beginning was very challenging and 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 daunting. But I think it's also nice that that I one of the things that I think about this whole move that it has forced all of us to be inventive and find new ways to work together and collaborate uh, with different kinds of people. And I think, you know, um, I, I teach at, at Pratt and we, we spend a lot of time talking about like, hopefully there's a, there are a lot of things that have been very challenging uh, in this time, but, but um, there are a lot of things that we have like accelerated very quickly. And hopefully, you know, we don't lose that when we, uh, hopefully, when we're able to go back and 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 um, resume what seems like a, a more normal life, but but I actually think that that this has sort of spurred these kinds of collaborations, which I think in in different under different circumstances maybe would we wouldn't have even considered. Um, and so for me, it was like a really good challenge um, to think about about how how can I actually help in this situation? Like, how can I make this experience better um, when I'm actually not constructing a physical thing? I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, you know, in a sense, I'm not doing what I traditionally do either, you know? And so I think that has been a really interesting part about this is like each of us in our own way, figuring out how we can still contribute um, and what we need to do to modify the things that we, we used to do before in a way that, that helps bring the whole work together. Um, and then on practical terms, it takes a long time. Um, it takes a, uh, hours. Uh, I, I don't know. I think, you know, we've, we've all been working on this, 
um, for a little bit uh, over a, a month, I would say, is, is about when we started talking. Um, and I would say, you know, at the beginning or, or, or like five weeks or so, the beginning was like meeting, you know, once once a week or something just to like throw some ideas. But the last two and a half weeks have, have been have been a, a good amount of work. Um, and and especially towards the end, getting all these spaces or figuring out the space and then feeding that and coordinating with with Emmy so that we could get all the video editing done also in time. Um, that was a, a lot of a lot a lot of work. Uh, I, I would say uh, probably actually a lot more work on, on Emmy's part. So I'll let her take over. <laughs> no, I think I mean I think it's a lot of work for everybody and, and you know like with any production um, when you want to really be very thoughtful about all the details. It, it takes time and care and energy. And I think what's really exciting for us is that this has been um, sort of a very low tech virtual reality uh, music series for us. And I'm personally really excited about the technological innovations happening in the VR world and the classical music um, side of that is really haven't integrated at all. So if there's anyone out there who is working on VR and interested in, in integrating music more, I think, you know, we would all be down to be guinea pigs and learn more about that and, and, and help, you know, bring the future to people who can't get to concert halls, which, you know, now is, is everyone. <laughs> and, and, you know, so how do we build these spaces um, that feel like we have texture and meaning um, when we aren't together? I think we're, we're kind of at the end of our time. I wanted to thank you all so much. I've, I've just been blown away by this just because of it as an outside observer uh, and all your contributions and, and, and kind of uh, this is <laughs> maybe one of the first times I felt actually genuinely optimistic about uh, a kind of non uh, uh, concerts in non concert spaces. So this has been really uh, this has been really thrilling to be a part of. I wanted to pass things off uh, uh, to Michael, who um, I think will kind of have some closing thoughts for us. So yeah, I just wanted to first say thank you to AJ for coming on board and leading um, such a lovely discussion. It was really great. I mean, even though we've been working closely on this for a, a, a while, you know, it's nice to hear um, my colleagues and collaborators' thoughts in you know in a more specific and articulated way, and, and that's just been wonderful. Um, I would be remiss not to thank uh, David Elitzer, who put the, the logistics of this project together um, for us and did a lot of the legwork behind the scenes, as well as Danelle Breyer for having us on the series. Um, please follow at Marshall Alums on Twitter for more information about future events. I can tell you that on the 10th of July, uh, the partnership with the Graduate Center at the City University of New York continues. Uh, with a celebration of the centennial of the 19th Amendment. Um, and the event is also going to focus on the battle for equal rights uh, and the Equal Rights Amendment, which, uh, as you all know, is very relevant to the present moment. And then on the 7th of August, um, there's an event entitled Spies, Secrets, uh, Soviets, and Type Leather Pants that uh, is being led by a Marshall Scholar um, who is a staff writer at uh, The New Yorker and uh, the host of the podcast, Winds of Change, that's out now on Spotify. Um, I also wanted to direct you all to the fabulous work that each of the panelists has done uh, as, have done as individuals. So what we're going to do is we're all going to post information about each other on various websites and social media um, platforms. So my name is Michael Pohl. You can find me on Facebook or on Twitter. It's, it's Elizabeth Algonek. Uh, the same, I think, is that right, Elizabeth? Um, I don't have Twitter. I have Instagram, uh, and I can be found on SoundCloud or at my website, which is elizabethelgonic.com. Um, I also know that Nico is about to release an album on Hyperion. Nico, will you just tell us briefly a little bit about that and where people can find that? Uh, well, yes, the, the release date has been pushed, pushed back a bit because of the <laughs> virus situation, but yes, it will be um, my debut disc for Hyperion with some rare music by York Boland, so watch out for that in a couple of months' time. And yes, you can check out my stuff on Facebook, SoundCloud, Instagram, website, and so forth. And I just got Twitter recently, so <laughs> I'm new at that. Um, similar for Emmy and one they both have websites, um, the links of which I don't have memorized, but if you use the Google, uh, or any other search engine of your choice, you'll be able to find out more about them. And like I said, we're going to cross post so that you can find any of us whose work you might be interested in finding out more about. 
So without uh, taking up too much of your afternoon, we have to thank you for joining us. And uh, it's really been wonderful to get to do this for you. So thank you very much and see you next time.